So, uh, I just spent a while doing some repairs and check it out. So, we kick the servos on. This thing is hardcore too, I mean, the whole machine is bouncing and it weighs 3,000 pounds. There's the spindle. So the other thing is these units are in a, it goes down to a, a thousandth of a millimeter, which is kind of amazing. I don't know if it can servo to any of that, but it's really precise. I can also uh, put it in manual operation mode. I'm not totally certain what's going on here because I believe this knob, which is the uh, the rapid control velocity knob should affect the speed of all of the traverses, but it only seems to work for the quill. Which incidentally also retracts at full speed all the time. It just only seems to be affected by the uh, this knob for the, the, the feet. Retract is just full tilt. Um, but it's definitely Unsurprisingly, I'm pretty excited. So I, I had to, uh, all the way these work is you, you tell the direction you want to go and then you, you push the button in the end and it actually causes the motion. So uh, I, I was, this is the button I had to replace is the one down here. Um, so if I pull it over to X plus, I kind of poke the button. That's it, cool, which is that. So we have manual operation. This is um, the electronic hand wheel. And I can change what they call the interpol factor. I'm not totally certain how. Um, it's having a couple issues related to, uh, it's having a few issues related to how I zero it. Principally, uh, it was going the wrong way to zero the, uh, the, the x axis traverse. And uh, <laughs> when it tried to do the auto zero, it slammed into one of it actually slammed all the way that way and kind of just got stuck, which is really annoying. It turns out you can enter a, um, uh, you enter a magic code into the system right after it comes up after a power reset, and then you can manually drive the axes. It's a, uh, let me look it up. Yeah, you boot it up, you put an 84159 into the input, you hit enter, and it goes into a manual override mode where it turns off apparently the limit switches, which were off anyways because it wasn't listening to them. Um, and then you can manually drive it, and at that point if you hit the, the, uh, the home switch, it works. Um, I suspect when I put the configuration in here, I might have gotten a value wrong. Uh, the way this thing works is when you power cycle, you have to type in a, a big pile of configuration values. In this case, it's uh, about 60 or 70 numbers you have to put in that dictate a lot of how the internals of the machine operate, and it's, um, I'm not totally certain I have the right machine values either, which is another problem. Um, I found them on a forum online, because the system had no documentation, and I'm dumb, and when I first got it, I pulled the battery out and dicked around in the controller before I figured out how to write them down, which I guess I can be somewhat forgiven for, considering that uh, the monitor didn't work at that point, so I couldn't have written them down anyways. Um, Oh, servos are off. Yeah, so obviously, uh, this here, that uh, pulls in this giant contactor and brings the servos up. That's servo power. So if, if I then hit, touch one of the e-stops, it turns it off. The e-stops latch, but you can also just push them temporarily and it just stops things. It's got a lot of fun things like the, um, hold down the spindle enable, you kick it to start and it pulls the contactor in and then it latches. Until you, you know, until you flip it off. Um, spindle brake is this. This is your. Oops. 
spindle break is this, it's a pneumatic little thing. So uh, that pushes down and that stops the spindle. I guess that's what this knob obviously does. Uh, I'm not, oh hey, <laughs> I didn't realize this is actually a button. So this is the, the speed control. It's got a, a, a variable belt transmission in there. And there's, this is actually an air motor. Let me just make sure you can see that. Yeah. So the way it works is this, when the system's running, you can effectively what happens is two pulleys and one of them, the sheaves come in and the other one, the sheaves extend and it effectively changes the belt ratio. So I'm pretty certain that, actually, yep. So you can actually hear that clicking noise is these, uh, what we have over here is, there's a couple of solenoids up here and these actuate the, uh, the air brake or the, the spindle brake, which is pneumatically driven. And they also actuate this, which is the air motor. So coming over here, we have the electronics. So we have, uh, these are the three servo amps. That's the power transformer for the servos. And then these are, they call them reactors. I think they're big inductors, lots of transformers. Um, this is the 24 volt DC supply that runs everything. This huge box down here, that's the, uh, the contactor for the, um, that's the, uh, the, the actual main contactor. So if I go over here, see if I can reach the e-stop button. <laughs> you think it's got a big enough giant, oh wow, I just pulled it in manually. I didn't know I could do that. <laughs> um, yeah. So, great giant relay of giant tude. Yeah, and then we just have lots of interconnects. This is for some of the lubricant stuff. This contactor up here is the spindle contactor, which you can barely see because it's dark in here. Um, yeah, so uh, that's the spindle contactor. I'm not too sure what those relays do yet. That is a, uh, that transformer there actually runs all the, uh, the 120 volt electronics on here. Uh, you can see my uh, slightly terrifying patch because I didn't have any spade terminals. This is also fun because these bolts up here have 240 volts on them. Um, I guess you're not supposed to have the cabinet open. <laughs> Here's the, uh, here, hang on a second. So this up here, oops, it's kind of sagging. So this is the greatest power switch ever. Thunk. And then when the cabinet door is closed, you have to hold this little tab down here. And then it closes, thunk. So obviously it's a, it's a break, make, very rapidly type process. Um, I think this is not intended to actually ever really be turned off. Around the back we have uh, two different things down here. So this is a, oops, I forgot to put the lid back on earlier. Um, it's upside down and I'm dumb and just got my hands all greasy. So there it goes. So this is a, a one shot lubricant system for the ways. What it does is it basically pumps oil out through these lines here into all of the, uh, the linear ways under high pressure. And what that does is that basically just produces a hydraulic film. And that's actually what they operate on. You can actually see how there's patterns scraped into the ways and that retains some of the oil and then they kind of glide on the hydraulic surface. Uh, this other box back here is a, uh, this is obviously, <laughs> it says spray mist on it. It's a spray mist system. So that runs out up to the spindle over here. Um, and this is a, uh, it sprays air and coolant onto whatever you're cutting. Um, my hands are all grungy. So that's kind of the overview of it. Um, let's see, it'll probably require me to rehome it again right now because I, um, I just power cycled it. Let me make sure that's. So, uh, here we are. Yeah, so clear in the operation. So, 84159, enter, software limits inactive. So now, bring up the servo. Servos are up. 
we wait until the the home, which is this key down here, I don't know if you can see it. So once this hits there, which is going to be right there. So that just kicks in. So now we're on the reference, so I have to keep the server enabled while I roll off it. But now that I'm off of it, you see that it's just, it keeps locked. So now we have to go Y minus. Am I going the right way? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. So we just, obviously you can see it kicked in and it, measured, it noticed or notated the position when we were at that point. So now I have to go Y plus. So now finally we extend the spindle a little bit and then it hits it on the retract. Right there. And we've completed the homing cycle. So now we turn into hand wheel mode. And now we can move the table. because it gives you so much information in parallel. You know, you have, it's basically a DRO with a controller built in, so you can see all your Axie readouts on discrete displays all the time at any moment, you know. In terms of like, yeah, so that's nice. So you can see here it hits load through Z, but it's smart enough that I can run into it and keep cranking it stops, but it doesn't prevent me from running the motor in the other direction, so it comes off the load through just easily, which is, Really nice engineering. Um, some of the, the controls I've dealt with where you, you run off the limit switch and you have to physically go in there and like move it off the limit switch. Um, there were, those were homemade CNC, so they might have been just been shit. Well, okay, they were shit heaps, but that's kind of, I hope, another separate problem. Um, but yeah, I just, yeah, so you can kind of see how. Um, so I'm actually not sure how you change the interpolation factor. There's a way to do it, I'm sure. I just, um, I'd have to read the documentation. Uh, actually reading manuals. Uh, I'm not sure why the auto home kind of fucked up earlier. But uh, yeah, that's annoying. Uh, so let's clear that warning. So we're in electric hand wheel mode. And there's also a lot of other things here that I'd like to push. We can kick it over into inch, where you can see now we get a, we get, we, it, it, the, it's, the encoders are high enough resolution that it reads out in thousands, which is, or tens, excuse me, tens, tens of thousands. So we have really high resolution, which is really nice. I'm happy about that. It's a very precise machine. It actually, it doesn't have as much travel as it looks like it does. It only has 18 inches of X travel, and I think probably 10 inches of, you know, six, you know, eight or 10 inches of Y. And Z is only gonna be about six inches. So it doesn't have a very big operating envelope, despite the size of the table. Like the, I can only bring the quill over to about that point on the table. It can't actually go past the end, which surprised me a little bit. But um, we're not ever gonna really do production on it, and it's big and it's rigid, which is really all well, you know each time I care about. So it leaves that. I just love how like look how fast this updates. It's so much better than you know some shitty system that talks to the computer and you know yeah. Anyways, so I'm pretty ecstatic about this and uh, more to come. So I guess I should it's turned off right now. I should answer before somebody asks. What still needs to be done? Um, the machine's filthy, it needs to be cleaned, and a lot of this material, like the gun stuck on the column, is like really stuck on the column, like it doesn't move with paper towels, we probably have to go into with solvents. The, the primary reason it doesn't work right now is one, we don't have very much in the way of tooling. Like we have one 
this is a it's a quick change 200 which is kind of an esoteric older quick change tool we have no of uh, none of the wrenches or anything we need to manage it and it also we also don't have uh, we only have one insert you know tool insert in there that fits that has a color it actually takes a um, ER17 color or something it's kind of esoteric and old the primary issue is right now it's been kind of jerry rigged to run on 240 volt single phase the spindle motor is a three phase motor so what we really need to you know the next thing on the to-do list is we're going to have to buy probably going to buy a VFD and run the spindle off that and there's going to be we're going to have to we're going to put it's probably going to go in the control box um, it also needs compressed air to run I have a very shitty little three gallon compressor um, that should probably be enough to keep up with like the spindle air motor and other things but I don't think it's enough for anything else uh, so, essentially, I realized while editing that I say so a lot. And any, so, that means that we need, you know, we may need a bigger compressor and we may need to do some testing. And I'm, you know, I'm not sure how much it checks. It certainly means that we're not going to be able to use the spray mist to any degree of efficacy simply because this takes a lot of air to run. Um, need to buy tooling. We don't have any on hand, you know. Whenever I've you know, done machining in the past, and each other's done far more machining than I have. I'm not really an experienced machinist. We've used, you know, the facilities provided by where we work. Now that we're doing it in our house, we need to buy tooling. I'm going to buy a hold-down kit, measure the T-slots earlier. Uh, also need to buy, you know, mills and all that other jazz. Uh, principally, though, it's just at this point the spindle, and there's been some discussion. Do we want to try and build a, a little tiny static phase converter? Do we want to, you know, to spring for a VFD? It's only two horsepower. A two horsepower VFD is about 100 to 150 dollars if you look around and shop a bit and are you willing to deal with having to interpret Chinese manuals and I don't really care about that so I'm okay with it you know I'll probably take it apart that will be a teardown so in any event basically right now the lack of a VFD and the lack of tooling are kind of the two primary factors that are preventing us oh the other thing we need the uh we have no uh knee crank so this is the uh the knee height adjustment uh, sorry let me move you down a little further I don't have a, a good view. I'm kind of leaning over the camera. So we don't have any way to really adjust the, the height of the knee right now because the crank is, uh, didn't come with it. <laughs> so we need to buy a new crank for that. But other than that, everything seems to be fine. The, uh, the fix to the, the button in here, I had to replace the button in here. Seems to be working fine. This is a, this is actually the replacement button supposed to be rated IP67. I don't know if I believe it. Um, I'm a little unhappy about the fact that the joystick seems kind of bent, but it, it works, so yeah, I'll probably just ignore it. This is kind of intriguing. I didn't realize this until I was kind of leaning on it earlier. Um, so this, uh, this knob is like compliant. This is like a, it's a foamed rubber, um, it's a foamed rubber material. You can kind of like yank on this and it, it just flexes. I wonder why they decided to go with a uh, a very soft, compliant material for this. It seems kind of like an odd choice, you know. I mean, if the joystick had was similar, I could see this, you know, if that way if you hit against it, it doesn't break anything. But the joystick is rigidly mounted, and this is all squishy. So, you know, maybe it's just they wanted less rotating mass, so you could flick it and it wouldn't spin as long. Seems kind of odd. Anyways, so to be continued.